distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's always very daunting to follow after a very inspired and very motivational speech, which we've just heard. And I want to thank Ms. Fareed for this wonderful opportunity we got of getting an insight. And I think it epitomizes some of the problems, some of the issues which confront us. When Mr. Rao was speaking, I was struck that here is an Indian businessman who 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago would have been talking about how the need to protect Indian entrepreneurship. Today, he thought it was interesting or it was for him a matter of concern that Mr. Trump was relocating his embassy to Jerusalem. Priorities change, his interests change, or whether the script has changed, I don't know. I also thank Ms. Farid for also reminding us that our links with Afghanistan are very age old. They extend to Panini, but they also extend to Shakuni. <laughs> the second part is a little more problematic. It extends to Ghazni, it extends to Ahmed Shah Masood. And I think it's important to realize that when we talk about change and leadership these days is always concerned with the, there, there's always that added thing, change. This is the 21st century. We are changing. In Afghanistan, the status of women cannot be that of the 7th century. It used to be said in Afghanistan that women are an invisible people. They must become visible. And that's one of the biggest manifestations of change which come in. At the same time, there are certain problems which are associated with change. Recently, I was at an exhibition in Berlin it was an exhibition on German colonialism. Now, German colonialism, as you well know, is not, wasn't, didn't have a very deep history. Really lasted for less than 60 years. And it was mainly concentrated around East Africa. And the treatment of that past was very interesting. It was irreverent. They didn't celebrate it. But what struck me most was that right at the conclusion of that exhibition, there was a statue of some governor of some East African province who had been a German, which had been once relocated from Dar es Salaam to Hamburg. And then sometime in the 60s, they decided to remove it. And they had that statue lying horizontal, flat, with spray painted on it. In other words, the heroes of yesterday can be trampled underfoot today. That, to my mind, marks something of a problematic degree of change. The marked irreverence which we have sometimes there is a difference between a critical view of the past and a dismissive view of the past. And change to be epitomized within that framework. It was Edmund Burke who once talked that when he was talking about governance. And he said, governance involves a contract between the living, the dead, and the unborn. And I think it's very important to look at that. When we talk about the environment, we often forget that we are really talking about the unborn. Just as much in Delhi, we also talk about the living who might also be dead. So the appreciation of change has to be very nuanced. There is a great excitement in embracing technology. 
Certainly, technology is very, very exciting. I remember the days as a student in the shortage economy of the 70s, when to even get a book meant traipsing many miles to the nearest library and then copying certain things by longhand, then coming back to the room and then reading it. Xerox was a luxury. Then came Xerox and now accessibility of information, accessibility of knowledge is not only easier but international. It's global. I can read any of the newspapers which we, uh, earlier we had to wait for three weeks if two had to get a foreign newspaper. So there is that ready excitement which has come about and the world has been made into a smaller place. Ms. Farid talked about the desirability. I would love the day when we can see the Kabuliwala back on the streets, smelling, uh, selling those dried fruits once again. It's childhood memories which come back. And it's something which we... I'd love to be in a position where I can actually travel to mazar -e sharif And we'd love to get those melons. Similarly, there is that need. And in Europe, it's now traveling is easier, purchasing is easier. So there is the desirability of having an economic integration where we talk about the global citizenship. But at the same time, let's look at what is happening in Europe. Why is it that despite a very contrived attempt to create an European identity, there is always that fallback into what is called the national identity. Does the fact that tomorrow, if Indian goods are available in Kabul or Herat or Kandahar, will they cease to be Afghans? Is it desirable that they cease to be Afghans? Is it desirable that just because we can get certain commodities from the United States, we'll suddenly look upon ourselves as Americans. So change itself has to be qualified. That there is a certain rootedness of India. There is a certain rootedness of every province. And when leadership talks about cosmopolitanism, when leadership talks about farsightedness, they often forget that it is important to actually locate our cultural roots. That when we talk about technology, when we talk about change, there is a global dimension. But there is what is called a body of indigenous knowledge which forms customs, which is sometimes called prejudices. Now the term prejudice itself is a very complex one. Prejudice can be twofold. One can be the prejudice saying that a woman's place is indoors, should not see the sunlight. That is a one form of prejudice. But there is also something called a prejudice which says, well, we mustn't sow this crop at this time of the year. That is born out of an accumulated local knowledge a body of traditional knowledge which sometimes passes off as prejudice but which again revives itself. Modern medicine is a classic example of that. What was thought to be a panacea for everything is today turning out in many cases to have debilitating side effects which was not the case earlier with traditional medicine. So the need for a constant balance and not to be overwhelmed by this excitement that change, we must change, we must change. And I think one of, the leader, one of the basic challenges which leadership has to confront more than ever before is to have a sense of what I might be calling common decencies. And those common decencies are age old. And those common decencies have to be upheld at every point. And secondly, a very 
firm sense of who we are. What is it? What is the essence of what we are? The essence of what we are is not determined by what clothes I'm wearing today, but what's actually in here. What is that identity? I'm not one of those who believes that the Bhagavad Gita contains all the wisdom. It may contain a lot of wisdom, but there must be wisdom which goes after it also. It is important to realize that what makes us is an amalgam of various influences. And it's, 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 it's fundamental to real, uh, for the leadership of the country to actually keep people well within that firm foothold of where we are. A leader has various choices. They can either follow a rabble, they can lead, or they can mold. They can be, they can, they must be both influenced and be an influencer. And I think that's really the, question, the challenge which we have, is that the word change has to be qualified in a very, very serious way. And it's always important when we confront the word change, we examine it far more and say, what sort of change? Is this a desirable change? Or is this a change which we would like to resist? And many of the political questions which we come across today really center on this problematic. The need to actually have a very sharp look. Otherwise, sometimes the term change, parivartan, is very heady, very exciting. The generation, each generation takes something of the preceding generation. But as someone said, between the 20th and the 21st centuries, the connection between the preceding generation and the following generation is becoming less, is becoming more and more tenuous. And that, to my mind, that rupture is something which we have to be alert to. Every generation, the pace of change is very rapid today. Can you realize that in India, for example, our GDP in the past 25 years grew more than what it happened in the past 150 years. So along with it, you can see what the corresponding shifts have been. And if at that, if at this moment we are not conscious of who we are, what our sense of rootedness is, what our inheritance is, what our view of the, of the future is, we are likely to get blown off our feet. Something which Tagore warned about, about keeping the doors open, allowing all the influences, but still having your feet firmly on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you so 